It is an honor and a very great pleasure for me to introduce the speaker for this 31st commencement exercise of Southern University at New Orleans, Dr. Benjamin Solomon Carson. Our speaker is an internationally renowned neurosurgeon, director of pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. He has been referred to as one of the acknowledged miracle workers of modern medicine. Raised by his mother, our speaker aspired to become a doctor at an early age. But in order to do so, he had to go against all of the odds. He had to overcome the obstacles of racism, rage, and poverty. He received his early education in the inner city elementary schools of Detroit, Michigan, where he started off very poorly because of a lack of motivation. To combat this, his mother insisted that he read at least two books every week. When he decided that he wanted to become a doctor, he soared from the bottom of his class to the top, conquering in the process his violent temper, and he realized that if he was to become a doctor and to be able to save others, he had to first save himself. With the help of prayer and Bible study, he was able to control his reactions. In 1969, he graduated third in his class from Southwestern High School in Detroit and received a full scholarship to Yale. Graduating in 1973, he entered the University of Michigan Medical School from which he graduated in 1977. In the meantime, in 1975, he married his wife, Lysena Candy Carson, whom he met while at Yale. Then came an internship in general surgery, followed by a five-year residency in neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Following a year as senior neurosurgical resident in Australia, he returned to Johns Hopkins, where at age 33, he was named director of pediatric neurosurgery. Often referred to as a top flight practitioner in his field, man of miracles, master of the scalpel, our speaker earned his reputation by successfully treating a number of seemingly hopeless cases. One was a malignant tumor of the brain stem in a four-year-old boy. While other physicians pronounced this cancer inoperable, Dr. Carson operated several times successfully and the youngster regained, recovered completely. Our speaker, however, is universally known for his success with hemispherectomies, the surgical separation of Siamese twins, which in the past had almost always resulted in the loss of one twin. He has lost only one of the 13 patients on whom he has performed this operation. The most prominent of these was the separation of the seven-month-old Bender Siamese twins from Germany, performed by our speaker and Dr. Donlan Long, chair of the Department of Neurosurgery at Hopkins, and a team of some 70 doctors, nurses, and technicians. The incredibly complicated surgery lasted 22 hours and was successful. It has, it has been referred to as one of the most complex surgical feats in the history of medicine. As a result, our speaker is constantly deluged by TV and print media journalists who all want an interview. Away from the hospital, however, Dr. Carson spends most of his time with his wife and three sons who are nine, seven, and six years of age. And despite the demands of his job, he finds time for Sunday church services. A devout Seventh-day Adventist, he views his medical accomplishments in terms of his religious faith. Just a few of his affiliations are, he has been named a diplomat with and for the American Board of Neurological Surgery. He is a 1988 Rotary International Paul Harris Fellow, recipient of Ebony's American Black Achievement Award in the Business and Professions category, and Morehouse University's Candle Award, to just name a few. Dr. Carson holds membership 
in the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Pediatric Oncology Group, and the National Medical Association. He has served as a member of the advisory board of Baltimore's Children's Cancer Foundation and honorary medical chairperson of the Baltimore, Maryland Red Cross. He has authored four books, perhaps the best known of which is Gifted Hands, the Ben Carson story. And, and he has contributed numerous articles to journals, including the Journal of the American Medical Association. Dr. Carson has been awarded eight honorary doctorates of science with multiple clinical and research interests and special emphasis on neuro-oncology, that is brain tumors, craniofacial reconstruction, pediatric seizure surgery, and, neuro and neurosurgical aspects of achondroplasia. Dr. Benjamin S. Carson is an associate professor of neurosurgery, plastic surgery, and oncology, as well as an assistant professor of pediatrics. Listed in Who's Who in America while still in his 30s, he has several scholarships named in his honor. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a rousing welcome for our speaker, Dr. Benjamin Solomon Carson. Thank you very much. It's indeed a great honor and pleasure to be here at uh, Southern University for this uh, most auspicious occasion. And uh, let me, first of all, congratulate those of you who are graduating. Uh, this is really sort of a turning point in your lives. You've already seen what can be accomplished by hard work. Now, let me set my stopwatch here so I don't get carried away because uh, I've spoken in a lot of different places, including some uh, Baptist churches. And, uh, you know, they start about 9.30 on Sunday morning and uh, end about Tuesday. So I uh, <laughs> have to make sure that we stay within the right uh, parameters of time here. Now, you know, speaking of, of time, one thing that's very important to understand is to become an educated person does require effort and does require time. I can remember when I was in high school and I would tell some of my classmates that I was going to become a physician, and they would laugh and they would say, you're going to be an old man by the time you finish. But a funny thing happened. When I finished, they were the same age as I was. <laughs> so the time didn't stop for them just because they didn't put it to good use. And that's a very important concept to keep in mind, uh, particularly those of you who are graduating today, recognizing that, you know, this is really just the beginning of a lifelong educational process, and it certainly does not stop at this point. Well, think also about the world that you're about to go out into. America is in the throes of significant changes right now. You know, a generation ago, it was quite possible for an individual to be a high school dropout and still do okay in this country. They could go and get a job in one of the Detroit factories, one of the steel mills or foundries, and uh, make top dollar. And if you had two people working in that household, so much the better. That's when we were a great industrial power. However, that industrial base has been largely lost. And our economy has turned to the point where we are now a service-oriented economy and a technical economy. Now, in order to take advantage of the technical aspects, it requires a great deal of education and a great deal of know-how. Neurosurgery, for instance, is in the technical arena. And I guarantee you, it's not an area that you can go into shucking and jiving. You really have to know what you're doing. Then again, there are the service-oriented areas. Um, McDonald's, things of that nature. Uh, a lot of those things are cropping up. And consequently, those individuals who have not availed themselves of the kind of education that will allow them to move to one area necessarily fall to the other area. 
and there's not a lot of middle ground. And that's one of the reasons that the fastest shrinking portion of our society right now is the middle class. And it's very important to understand that as you begin to prepare yourselves for what's going on. Now, last May, I was in Boston, and I was receiving an honorary, honorary degree. And one of the co-recipients was Alan Brumley, who was President Bush's scientific advisor. He was telling us about a survey. This was the latest survey in which 22 nations of the world participated. And the subject matter was science and math. Now, the United States of America, great and wonderful, powerful nation that we are, we were not number one out of 22 nations, or two or three. Now, that should be somewhat alarming to you. But interestingly enough, we weren't even number five or 10. We weren't even 15. And of course, there aren't even 15 industrialized nations. So we're starting to drop below some of the non-industrialized nations here. We weren't even number 20. We were number 21 out of 22 nations. The only nation we beat out was Jordan, and that was a squeaker. Non-industrialized third world nation. Children running around bare feet frequently, dodging bullets. We barely beat them out. Now that's a problem. And yet I dare say, had we had the same survey done, but instead of looking at science and math, we had looked at sports and entertainment, I bet we would have been number one, hands down. No one could have touched us, for we are the nation in which more than half of the nation will stay up to try to find out whether or not Michael Jackson bleaches his skin. <laughs> we are the nation where people will spend $49 and 50 cents to buy a book called Sex about Madonna, some skinny broad who doesn't even look good. <laughs> That's us. And we think those things are important. We think it's important to know how many baskets Michael Jordan sunk from 25 feet and what the batting average of Bo is. And these things, and we crowd our minds with silliness and can't derive a quadratic equation and can't fill in a map of the United States with all of its capitals. You know, I was looking at an article in the Wall Street Journal last year, and it had an exit exam. It had a sample exam that a person would be expected to be able to pass to get a high school diploma in this country at the turn of the century. And the questions on that test were the derivation of a quadratic equation, all the state capitals. You had to be able to fill in a map of Europe with capitals. You had to know your American history as well as your world history. You had to be able to tell at what point two trains would meet if one left San Francisco traveling at 40 miles an hour and another one left Boston traveling at 35 miles an hour. High school, I'm talking here, not college, at the turn of the century. What's happened? What has happened to our nation? If you gave a test like that to high school students now, they'd think you were nuts. Why would you be expecting them to know that? Many college students would think you were nuts wouldn't think that that was reasonable. And yet that was standard fare. So clearly, something has happened along the way. Now, I have to confess that I cannot understand it, particularly as a neurosurgeon, because as a neurosurgeon, I spend an awful lot of time looking at brains. Not just the brains of humans, but also the brains of animals as an academic neurosurgeon. And you know something? The human brain is the most sophisticated, complex organ system in the entire universe. No computer comes close to it. For a computer to do what the human brain does, it would have to be 60 stories tall 
and cover a surface area the size of the city of Dallas, Texas, to do what one human brain can do, over 14 billion, with a B, cells and connections in it. And yet, the average person has one of these. And yet, how many average people do you see walking around complaining about what they cannot do? See, animals don't have these well-developed brains. They don't have these big frontal lobes. They're not capable of rational thought processing. They're not capable of taking information from the past and the present and projecting it into the future. They're not capable of responding with perspective. And that's why animals have to be victims of circumstance. They have to sit there and take whatever is dealt to them. People don't have to do that. People have the ability to change their circumstances because of the tremendous intellectual potential with which their creator endowed them. And yet, too many people decide that they want to act like animals. They decide that they want to let the environment control them. They, they decide that the circumstances are in control, and instead of doing something about problems, they complain about them, and they gripe about them, and don't put that tremendous intellect into being. Now, to give you an example of how sophisticated your brain is, how many people here remember how they got here today? Okay, I see several people whose brains are working. Okay. Now, <laughs> this is good. Now, those of you who cannot remember, listen carefully. Because I guarantee you, you really can remember. You know, those who could remember, it didn't take you very long to respond to that question. And yet, what did your brain have to do? Let me tell you what your brain had to do. First of all, the sound waves had to leave my lips, travel through the air, enter your external auditory meatus, travel down to your tympanic membrane, set up a vibratory force there, which was transmitted across the ossicles of your middle ear over into the oval and round window, setting up a vibratory force in the end of the lymph, which mechanically distorted the microcilia. Wait a minute, we got a ways to go here. And that converted the mechanical energy to electrical energy, which traveled across the cochlear nerve to the cochlear nucleus at the pontal medullary junction, from there to the superior olivary nucleus, ascending bilaterally up the brainstem through the medial meniscus to the inferior colliculus and the medial geniculate nucleus, across the thalamic radiations to the posterior temporal lobes to begin the auditory processing. We still got a ways to go. And then from there to the frontal lobes, that down the tract of Victor Jour, retrieving the memory from the media hippocampal structures and the mammary bodies back to the frontal lobes to start the motor response at the bet cell level, coming down the cortical spinal tract, across the internal capsule, into the cerebral peduncles, descending down to the cervical medullary decussation, into the spinal cord, gray matter, synapsing there, going out to the neuromuscular junction, stimulating the nerve and muscle so you could raise your hand. Now, now I hate to say this. But that, of course, is the simplified version of what your brain had to do. I don't want to talk about the coordinating and inhibitory influences coming from the cerebellum, basal ganglion, red nucleus, etc. We've been here all day. But if your brain can do that, and you barely have to think about it. Can you imagine what the human brain is capable of when people actually put their mind to it? And yet, I was not an individual who, who, always, who always thought that way. As a youngster, my idea of a good time was going to school and goofing off all day. I was the one shooting the paper wads. And you youngsters up there in the audience, whose brothers and sisters and relatives are graduating, you listen to me. Because I was the one shooting the paper wads and making the funny noises when the teacher turned her back. And the one who was anxious to get out of school so I could go home and play outdoors until dark and then go inside and watch TV till bedtime. And as a result of that, I had no competition for last spot in my fifth grade class. In fact, I was what you might call the safety net. No one had to worry about getting the lowest mark on the test as long as I was around. Now, that may have brought comfort to some of my classmates, but it certainly didn't bring comfort to my mother, who was quite alarmed with this uh, poor academic performance. In fact, I remember once my fifth grade math teacher praised me when I got a D in math. And uh, D was not for delightful. But you see, I had a basic philosophical difference with my math teacher. 
math teacher thought that it was necessary to know your timetables. And uh, I didn't think it was necessary because the timetables were printed on the back of the notebooks. And I figured you could just look at the back of the notebook whenever you needed to know. So you could imagine what kind of grades I got. But you know, my, my mother was exceedingly alarmed when she saw my report card. And you know, my mother was one of those individuals who only had a third grade education, who was stuck with the problem of trying to raise two boys by herself in the inner city with no money, no education, no resources, but she would never adopt what I call the victim's mentality. She always felt that her destiny was in her own hands and that she could do something. And if that meant working three jobs at a time, which she frequently did as a domestic in order to stay off of welfare and to control her own life, that's what she was going to do. But she was alarmed when she saw that report card, and my brother was doing poorly also. And she didn't want us to end up in the same situation she was in. So she prayed, and she asked God to give her wisdom. What could she do to get her young sons to understand the importance of education? And you know something? God gave her the wisdom, at least in her opinion. My brother and I weren't convinced that it was wise at all because it was to turn off the TV set and to allow us to watch only two or three TV programs per week and with all that spare time, read books. Two books apiece from the Detroit Public Library and submit to her written book reports, which she couldn't read, but we didn't know that. <laughs> so she had pulled a fast one on us. And uh, there we were, working very hard on that process. And you know, I decided I would get books that had a lot of pictures in them. That wouldn't be nearly as painful. But uh, interestingly enough, those pictures were so interesting that after a while I wanted to read the legend beneath them. And I wanted to read the page next to the picture. And I wasn't so concerned about the picture itself. And uh, all of a sudden, I started acquiring an enormous amount of information. And you know, within the space of a year and a half, I went from the bottom of the class to the top of the class. And pretty soon, people were coming to me. The students would come to me by the time I was in the seventh grade, and they'd say, hey, Benjamin, how do you work this problem? And I would say, sit at my feet, youngster, while I instruct you in higher math. <laughs> I probably went a little overboard. I remember in the ninth grade, I went up to one of my classmates, and I said, Dennis, why do you hate me so much? And he looked me dead in the eye and he says, because you're so obnoxious. And I said, obnoxious? Moi? I mean, just because I would expound for 15 minutes every time the teacher asked a question, I thought I was doing my classmates a service, but I began to understand that maybe they resented that a little bit. So I began to pipe things down a little bit. But you know, the important thing to recognize there is that when I was in the fifth grade and when I was in the seventh grade, I had the same brain. There was no brain transplant in between. The thing that changed was my self-concept and my opinion of what I could do. And this is a vitally, vitally important thing. Not only for yourselves as graduates, but for all those youngsters that you're gonna come into contact with and that you're going to influence. You see, because if things are going to change in our nation, it's going to require individuals understanding the process that leads us to a situation where right now in America, there are more African-American young men in the criminal system than there are in college. And we're gonna to have to find a way to change that. But I'm gonna tell you something. I don't think society at large is going to change it. It's going to require change from the grassroots level within the communities that are affected. But first of all, as a physician, in order to cure the disease process, first of all, you have to understand the pathophysiology of the process. You must understand what created the process and what's going on. What has created the situation that leads us to situations of despair in our cities? What has led to a situation where 
certain aspects of our society, such as black males, are considered an endangered species. What is happening here? Well, you think about it. Young man, full of enthusiasm, born into our society, just as much of a sparkle in his eye as anybody else has, ready to go out and conquer the world. Goes to school, opens up that American history book, ready to learn about his ancestors. Keeps turning, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter 20, chapter 30. Doesn't see anything except slavery. Starts to say, hmm, well, maybe next year. Next year we'll take world history, I'll find out then. Gets that world history book, starts looking through it. Chapter one, chapter two, chapter 20, chapter 30. Doesn't see anything. Hmm, that's very strange. He begins to wonder, where do I fit into this whole picture? What is this stuff about the American dream anyway? Then he turns the television on, and he says, ah, oh, there I am, bouncing a basketball, catching a football, hitting a baseball, and look how much money I'm making, millions and millions of dollars. He says, there it is, that's the American dream for me. And see, the media wants him to think that, because see, the media doesn't tell you the rest of the story that only seven and one million will make it as a starter in the NBA. Don't tell them that part. And that's why you see all these young men from sun up to sundown when the weather is warm out there shooting baskets. And if you ask them, every single one of them thinks they're gonna make it. They don't know the statistics. And see, the media doesn't tell them that they, even if they do make it, if they're one of the few that the average career span is only three and a half to four and a half years. Nope, leave that part out. And, you know, if you do tell them, they'll come up with some smart aleck answer. They'll say, look, what about Kareem? He played for 20 years. Well, see, now, doesn't that just tell you that when he was in school, he wasn't listening when they taught about averages? Because if he was, he would know that if Kareem played for 20 years, somebody played for only two months. And the media doesn't tell you that part. And they don't tell you about five, ten years down the road when you're not playing at all. And you don't have any money and you don't have any skills because you didn't learn anything in college because the system just took advantage of you. And that's why so many of those young athletes end up in trouble with the law, end up in crime and in drugs, trying to maintain that lifestyle. They don't tell you about any of that. Okay, so you get one to listen. She says, okay, okay, I, I agree. Sports, it's very unlikely that I'm gonna make it in that field. But you know, I can be an entertainer. I mean, every time I turn on the TV, MTV, BET, I see all these people rapping and they're having a good time and they got these big baggy pants on, look like you could fly in them. And they're just having such a good time. And I say, I could do that. And look at all the money I could make. And when I open my jet and when I open my ebony, I see the fabulous homes they have and the wonderful cars they drive. This is the American dream. But see, the media, again, fails to tell you that only one in 10,000 will make it in any lasting way in the field of entertainment. Don't tell you that part. And when Robin Leach comes on and does all this stuff about lifestyles of the rich and famous and shows them sitting by the pool, sipping their pina coladas and on their fabulous yachts, they don't tell you that as soon as the cameras go off, those guys are scampering for the telephone, calling up their agent, trying to figure out where they can get on another TV show, or if they can get into a magazine somewhere. How can they stay in the limelight? It's a miserable life. Can you imagine a life that is dependent upon self-aggrandizement? A life that is dependent upon trying to get other people to see how wonderful you are and to be talking about you? That's misery. That's not success, that's misery. And the media tries to make that out as the most outstanding thing that a person can do. And they've been extremely successful in doing this. And that's why we're number 21 out of 22 nations. Not only in the African American community, they've been successful in our nation at large in distorting the values that people have. You know, somehow, I was lucky enough to understand a lot of that and to move forward as an excellent student. 
That is, until I got into high school, when I ran into the worst thing a high school student can run into, it's called peers. P-E-E-R-S. Negative peers. Stands for people who encourage errors, rudeness, and stupidity. Because that's what negative peers do. And there are a few more destructive forces that a person can run into. And they were saying, Carson, you know, in order to be cool, you got to wear certain clothes. In those days, it was the Italian knit shirts with the suede fronts and the shark skin pants. Now, many of you graduates, you don't know what shark skin pants are, but they used to change colors when you moved around in the light. <laughs> and thick and thin socks and alligator shoes and stingy brim hats and leather jackets. And I know it sounds like a clown suit now, but back in those days, if you didn't have that stuff, I mean, you were in bad shape. Now, the young people these days, fortunately, don't have any fashion problems, do they? <laughs> oh, they do. I see. Well, I must admit, I'm a little taken aback when I see these young people walking around with these blue jeans that already have holes in them. You buy them with holes in them. Somebody's ripping you off, I'll tell you. And what about the gym shoes? $50 a pair. $100. $150 a pair. No electronic equipment in them. No telephones like Maxwell Smart, none of that stuff. $150? Can you believe that? Well, you know something very interesting? Remember that survey we were talking about, which we were number 21 out of 22? Guess who was number one? Japan. I've heard a lot of people say Japan. It wasn't Japan, but let me tell you about Japan. They were number two, by the way. I was looking at a program in which one of the governors was interviewing the CEO of Toyota from Japan. And he asked him, what percentage of the Japanese workforce is illiterate? And the Japanese CEO kind of looked at him with a twinkle in his eye. And he says, by American standards, 0%. He says, by Japanese standards, about 15%. But he says, by Japanese standards, you're illiterate if you cannot program a computer. They were number two. Number one was South Korea. Now, guess where they make those gym shoes? You got it. South Korea. For $6 a pair. Think about that. They make them for $6 a pair. We buy them for $150. $50 a pair. They're number one. We're number 21. Somewhere in there is a fool. And I don't think, I don't think it requires a lot of thinking to figure out where. Somebody's laughing all the way to the bank because there's a whole nation full of people who run around snapping up these shoes because some silly athlete gets on the television, shoots a 25-foot jump shot, and points to his shoes and says, that's the reason I can shoot that shot. <laughs> well, look, if you believe that, you deserve to pay $150 for a $6 pair of shoes. Because you're not using your brain anyway, so you're going to lose the money anyway. So why not give it to them? And what I'm talking about here is values. And what I'm talking about here is perspective, which God gave us a brain so that we could learn what true value was. Suppose you had an offer, graduates, an audience, that you could have anything in the world that you wanted today to carry out of here, but you had to be able to carry it in one hand. What would you take? Well, some people who are very analytical and and uh, schooled in terms of values of the world would say, I'll take the Hope Diamond. Because with that, I can walk out of here and I'll be set for many generations. But then again, what if you had the Hope Diamond and you walked out of here and you discovered you were the only person on earth? How valuable would it be then? You'd be better off to have an apple. At least you could eat that. 
it would have no value whatsoever because it doesn't have any inherent value. The only reason it's valuable is because a bunch of other folks want it and because a bunch of folks have said that it's valuable, but it's not really valuable. What's valuable is the talent that God gave you to develop into a person that other people need, into a person who is not selfish, into a person who can expand the horizons of others around them. That's what success is all about. It has nothing to do with houses and cars and bank accounts, of which I have plenty, but I guarantee you they're not important because think about this. Someone comes along and takes my house and cars and bank accounts, I won't be happy about it, but guess what? I can get all those things right back almost instantly with what's up here. That they can't take away. And that is what Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, was talking about when he said, gold is nice, silver is nice, rubies are wonderful, but to be valued far above all these things is knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Because those are the things that give you perspective. You know, I am delighted to be speaking here at a predominantly African-American institution. Yesterday I gave a commencement at a white institution, uh, Washington University School of Medicine. And there were very few African-Americans graduating there. But you know, I've seen a very disturbing trend as I've gone across the nation. I have seen African-Americans trying to isolate themselves from the rest of society. I've seen them trying to say that certain things are not relevant for them. Not recognizing that this country belongs to all of us. It does not belong to only a certain segment of us. And I think what we need to be doing is not simply trying to learn those things which some people think are culturally relevant, but trying to expand our horizons. You know, when I was in high school, one of the things that I wanted to do was be a contestant on GE College Ball. It's a program that pitted different colleges against each other. They would ask questions in science and math and history and geography, all kinds of things. And I thought I was pretty good at those things, but they also asked questions about art and classical music. And going to an inner city high school in Detroit, I didn't know anything about those things. So I said, whose responsibility is your education, Benjamin? And I concluded that it was my responsibility. So I said, so how can I learn these things? So I would get on the bus and go downtown to the Detroit Institute of Arts, and I would roam through those galleries until I knew every picture in there, who painted it, when they were born, when they died, what period it represented. And I always had my portable radio listening to Bach, Telemann, and Mozart. And the kids in Detroit thought I was nuts. You know, black kid in Motown listening to Mozart? They thought I had completely lost contact with reality. But the fact of the matter is, I had a specific goal in mind. I had something that I was trying to accomplish. And you know, I even decided which college I was going to attend based on college ball, because I had only $10, the application fee to one college, and I said, I'm going to apply to the college that wins the grand championship of college ball. And it turned out that the grand championship that year was between Harvard and Yale. And Yale wiped Harvard out. So I didn't want to go to a school with a bunch of dummies like Harvard, so I applied to Yale. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, they accepted me with a scholarship, and off I went. And um, thinking I was going to be on College Bowl, but you know the year I went to college was the year College Bowl went off the air. <laughs> so it looked like I'd done all that boning up for nothing. Or had I? You see, years later when I decided I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, I said, I'm going to apply to the program best known for neurosurgery, that's Johns Hopkins. Well, they only took two people a year out of 125 top applicants. So what was I going to do to distinguish myself? Everybody had a stellar academic record. Well, when I went for my interview, the fellow in charge of the interviews was a tremendous classical music buff. 
So we talked for a little while about medicine, a little while about neurosurgery, and the conversation turned to classical music. And we talked for over an hour about different composers and their styles, different conductors and their styles, the various orchestras and orchestral halls. The man was on cloud nine, and there was no way he wasn't taking me into the program. Because <laughs> he had to have somebody to discuss the stuff with, you know? And the point being, suppose I had listened to those individuals who said, Carson, you shouldn't be learning that European music. Well, let me tell you something. The reason God gave us such capacity is so that we could learn everything. And you decide how influential you're going to be. Now, if you just want to influence the people in your house, you just need to know what's relevant to the people in your house. If you want to influence your city, you need to know what's relevant to the people in your city. And if you want to influence the world, you need to know what's relevant to the people of the world. You make that decision. And we need also to start studying ourselves. You know, maybe the history books don't have the accomplishments in them. But you can take a young man or a young lady by the hand and walk down the streets of New Orleans and you can give them your own history lesson. When you walk across that street and you see that red light, you can tell them about Garrett Morgan, an African American who invented that stoplight. And when you walk by the hospital, you can tell them about Daniel Hale Williams, an African-American who did the first open-heart surgery in this nation. You can tell them about Charles Drew and his contributions. And when you walk by the railroad tracks, you can tell them about Andrew Beard, who invented the automatic railroad car coupler, who had helped spur on the Industrial Revolution. You can tell them about Elijah McCoy, who invented the automatic lubricator. In fact, he had over 50 major patents. His patents were so good, people would say, is that a McCoy? Is that the real McCoy? David Duke runs around talking about the real McCoy, doesn't even know who he's paying homage to. <laughs> and we can start to instill into our youngsters a sense of true pride and to understand that our heritage does not exist only in sports and entertainment, but in intellectual accomplishments. The lighting in this room, Louis Latimer, read about his accomplishments. There's so many others that have influenced everything that you see. Any place you go, there are threads of it. And I, for one, will be delighted when there's no such thing as Black History Month, when the accomplishments of African Americans are integrated into the history of this nation. Well, I'm about to get carried away here, so I just watched, I just took a look at my watch and realized that this is a graduation and that we do have to pass out some diplomas here. But before I stop, I want to just say one very important thing. Young people, if you will adopt this philosophy, to think big, you will be successful in life. The T is for talent. Not just the ability to sing, dance, or throw a ball, but intellectual talent. Discover what your intellectual talents are, develop them, and choose a career that allows you to use them. You'll go much further, much faster. The H is for honesty. If you lead a clean and honest life, you won't put skeletons in the closet. Because if you put them there, they will come back to haunt you. You can ask Richard Nixon, you can ask Zoe Baird, you can ask anybody. They will come back. And also, if you always tell the truth, you don't have to worry about what you said three months ago. And you can concentrate on the task at hand. The I is for insight, which comes from listening to people who've already gone where you're trying to go. Solomon, great character said, wise is the person who can listen to someone else's experiences and learn, and the person who thinks he knows everything already and cannot listen is a fool. The N is for nice, because if you're nice to people, once they get over their suspicion of why you're being nice, they'll be nice to you, and you'll get so much more accomplished in life. The K is for knowledge, which is the thing that makes you into a valuable person doesn't really matter what other people say and what other people think. If you have made yourself into a valuable person, then you are a valuable person. And don't worry about prejudice and racism. 
Because it exists, it existed yesterday, it exists today, it'll exist tomorrow, and it will exist as long as there are people with small minds and a devil to stimulate them. That's not your problem. But you know, my mother told me when I was a youngster, she said, Benjamin, if you walk into an auditorium full of racist, bigoted people, she said, you don't have a problem, they have a problem. Because see, when you walk in there, they're all going to cringe and wonder if you're going to sit next to them, whereas you can go sit anywhere you want. <laughs> so, if they want to have a heart attack, let them. you got better things to do with your time. The B is for books, which is the mechanism whereby that knowledge is obtained. Not television. Television doesn't require any creativity on your behalf. Doesn't require the use of your imagination. Reading does. With reading, you have to put letters together to make words. So you learn how to spell. We've had public officials who couldn't even do that. And then you can take the words and put them together into sentences. So you learn grammar and syntax. And then the sentences into concepts. So you learn to use your imagination. So reading has tremendous effect on intellectual development. I will go so far as to say I have never seen a highly successful person who is not a reader. The second I is for in-depth learning, learning for the sake of knowledge and understanding as opposed to superficial learners. Superficial learners are those people who are responsible for us being number 21 out of 22. They wait until an exam is almost upon them, they cram, cram, cram. Sometimes they even do okay in the exam and three weeks later they don't know anything. Now I'm sure none of the graduates know anyone like that. <laughs> but that kind of knowledge is not worth the money or the time or the effort you took to get it when the Lord has given you a Rolls Royce brain which can learn anything. And finally the G, the most important letter, is for God. You know, don't ever let anybody make you ashamed of God or even talking about God in public. We have reached a sad state in our country where there are some individuals who will tell you you're not supposed to mention God in public. Well, you know what I say to them? I say they're schizophrenic. <laughs> because every coin in their, in their pocket and every bill in their wallet says, in God we trust. And they still spend money in public. <laughs> and when their kids go to school the first day, they learn to say the Pledge of Allegiance to that flag. And it says we are one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And the fact of the matter is, when you can put God in the center of your life, you can take yourself out, and that's when you can learn what true value is. Congratulations, and thank you very much.